Welcome. Good to see you, bro. You're doing great. Very excited to be here. Yeah. Good to see you, Sienna. Thank you. And whilst we wait for the president of ACLA Foundation, I mean, this guy is a busy guy, the most busiest guy right now because why? Twitter just HQ'd in Ghana. And um, they are, they're part of this organization to get this done. So uh, I'm, I'm sure Foster will be joining us quite soon because I need to see his video turn on. But let's dive right into the conversation, right? Um, building a digitally enabled Africa, the role of youth. And I'm very much thankful that I'm hosting youthful people here, not only the, hosting the whole folks. All right, let's start with you, Sienna. What do you think we can do to build the next generation of digital Africa? What are the steps we should take? And when, why should we take them? Wow, that's a very good question. Very extensive. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, my thoughts on this would be that uh, we need to start um, right now from every stage. I know sometimes we, we tend to start with either the current youth or with the kids, but I'll say we need to start from every stage. So first of all, we've started well by having some um, organizations like um, the boot camps uh, that have been organized by maybe, um, let me just mention a few names, developers in Vogue and even Hackla Foundation and um, y'all and so many organizations. I think they are doing really well. They've started really good. But um, the question is, how do we make it uh, sustainable? Uh, we need to make sure that we have the backing of um, the government. As we usually say, we really need the backing of the government because I remember when I was doing the research one time, people be like, they do not listen to much of some private things unless the government uh, kind of spearheads it. So we really need the government on our side to make sure that all our strategies and ideas can be implemented. And would also need to basically invest in education and awareness, as I said, in all stages for every um, part of uh, the youth and also the kids. So I think that would be my short question. <laughs> sorry, my, sh my short answer to your long question. Okay, uh, I'm so sorry I had to ask a long question. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it, what it is, this, these are these are burdening issues, right? And we are yeah. so glad to have the sing we, we have the singular honor to have the president of Hakla Foundation and the person of Foster Awintiti Akugri. But before we go into you to you, Foster, um, let's let's hear what Winger has to say. Mind you, we are asked we ask I asked the question around what can we do now to upscale um, youth building the next generation of digital Africa. Winger, let's hear your reaction, please. Okay, so um, first of all, I think that youths are like a very um, uh, key part to play, key role to play. When you look at the energy and you look at the passion of young Africans, 60% of whom are under the age of 30, by the way. Oh, I mean, this offers an enormous opportunity for Africa as a whole. And Africa has significant digital infrastructure and skills gaps. For instance, we, between 5 and 50% of the population having consistent access to the internet, uh, compared to, say, 80% and above in Europe and North America, there's a huge gap. Now, how about the high cost of data, for instance? Um, a gigabyte of data in Zimbabwe costs over seventy-five dollars. In Equatorial Guinea, one gig costs over sixty-five dollars. Right. So these are issues. But what can youths do? What is the role of the youth? I think like one key thing that youth can do immediately is to acquire digital skills. Essentially. Now I know that even in the previous panels, you know, we've all been talking about this, but we really need to. African youths need to fire their excuses as young people. We need to do what we can to add digital skills with however little it is. Because when you're loaded, you're needed, right? And since you cannot give what you don't have, the first step in playing a role in the digital economy is really like acquiring a skill. Acquiring a skill, because how can you contribute into a conversation when you don't even know or understand the conversation, right? So if we must address poverty, inequality, and succeed as young people, we actually need to stop waiting for the government, you know, our parents, our spiritual leaders, you know, help coming from somewhere. We need to rise up. We will do what we can with what we have. And I'm going to give you an example, right? Because somebody might be watching this and, you know, go like, you know, Benga, you're, you're not in touch with reality or something like that. So let me just give an example very quickly. When I finished my secondary school education in Nigeria, I wanted to learn computers. I was fascinated by computers. I just wanted to learn computer engineering, desktop publishing, things like that. And so I went to meet my parents, you know, I told them, you know, dad, I would like to learn. And he, my dad is a very frank person. He told me point blank. See, I like what you say you want to do, but your siblings are in university and I don't have the budget for this. Right? It was very plain with me. And instead of taking no for an answer, what did I do? I walked down the street, 
walk into the nearest primary school, ask to see the head teacher, and then I told her, Ma, I can teach any subject. I'm available. I'm ready to teach. She was like, I have never seen anybody like you. Like, I have never come across somebody like you. There was no vacancy in the school at the time. She created a vacancy. She made me PA. There was nothing like PA in that school. She made me PA. And then, you know, the teacher resigned about two months later. I got that slot, right? I thought for about six months, saved all of that money, went to a computer center, checked myself in, used that money to pay for my own tuition by myself. By the time I gained um, admission to university, in my first year, I, I, I was so skilled that I was literally training people in their final year. And so at that point in time, even money from home was meaningless. Like at the point, I just stopped asking for money from home. It was my parents that were even calling to ask me, like, ah, don't you need our money again and all of that. Now, why am I sharing this experience? I'm sharing this experience because a lot of times young people just sit down waiting for manner to drop from heaven. The excuse that you have is because the government is not working, you know, your parents are poor, and you're telling sad stories. I, I think that anybody watching this, even if you don't make any other thing from what I'm saying right now, don't forget this. You need to fire your excuses. Do what you can to make money legitimately, right? Do what you can. Whatever leg up, uh, legit also that you can do to acquire the skills because when you are needed, you are loaded. So I think I will just stop there for now, right? About acquiring digital skills. Just go the extra mile. Wow. Acquiring digital skills. Um, well, that's one thing we are lacking so far, so good in Africa. We want to see that upskill line. Um, I mean, Foster with its organization, Hack Lab, uh, who is the president of Hack Lab Foundation, can tell us more about what they're doing because. Um, it's so quite interesting to have that uh, Twitter is in Ghana and um, they are leading the front, right? First of all, what can you tell us about um, upscaling digital Africa, right? Um, what can we do? What should we do? Foster, you are muted? I can. Hello, Foster. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Welcome on board. Good to have you. Can you hear me? For having me in this very important forum uh, to share my opinion. So to answer your question, when we talk about upscaling and skill uh, skills development, I believe it's a national agenda, right? Um, there's always a need to set an agenda all the way from the top for it to cascade down and let the key stakeholders involved in contributing to to closing these gaps and ensuring that uh, we are in the right path is key it's not only about churning out skills it's about churning skills relevant to the to the, the economy right so if you are a, a manufacturing economy you don't go spending so much time investing in uh, engineer de uh, developing engineering skills you need to invest heavily in in, in, in in developing skill sets that close the gap or the demand within the industry in which your country focuses on. So if Ghana intends to become, for example, uh, an agricultural economy or an agri-focused economy or agri at the center or the core of its industry, then it wants to develop skill sets within that area. Today we are talking about digital transformation and governments, the governments, private organizations, and every key uh, business from SME startups and co are all along on this journey, including academic institutions. No industry is being left behind. And this is not only affecting Ghana, but affecting the globe as a whole through the fourth industrial revolution. It puts us in a position where globalization is making us not compete amongst each other in the country anymore for jobs but competing with other people across the continent for jobs. Uh, what this means is as organizations start to move more digital and remote work becomes primary to how we do things, means you, your, competition, your competition to get a job opportunity has increased now more than before. And so we need to be very, very deliberate in our approach in, in setting quotas and defining clearly where the country is headed and what skill sets are needed to help the country get to where it goes to. Now, um, on the other side, right, we've, there's been two schools of thought when it comes to uh, uh, skills development and unemployment. Right? A school of thought believes that 
graduates that churn out of tertiary institutions or academic institutions are round, round uh, square pegs that do not fit in round holes. That means there are jobs available, but the skill sets that are churning out of these schools are not fit for these jobs. There's another school of thought that says, as the graduate churn out, the ratio of graduate churning out and the number of jobs available is, is very, the, the, the proportion is very wide, right? is unevenly wide and this causes a, uh, less than 20 percent of of maybe every hundred thousand students that graduate to be absorbed into the job market leaving eighty thousand people uh, there's now a new route of starting a venture through entrepreneurship and the sprout of incubators and accelerated programs in the country is helping close this gap gradually but are we still solving the problem because these people are starting businesses and would need talent to fit these to fill job roles within these organizations. And so the more the more jobs, the more businesses we are creating doesn't necessarily warrant that we are preparing the talents needed to fill these jobs. And so we need to go back to the roots, which is our academic institutions, and figure out a way to increase employability, as well as we deliberate in our agenda in how we build a correlation between industry demands and what academic institutions churn out. Thank you so much, Foster. Um, that's a lot to take in, talking about building from the top down. All right. Uh, Sienna, let's talk about your role at um, Microsoft as a program's lead, right? Um, we see a lot of um, youths look out to get educational degrees. I'm talking about upscaling digital Africa, right? And it's all about the degrees and what the universities are contributing. But I see that private institutions, Microsoft, the likes of Twitter and stuff, are organizing um, either hackathons or whatever in, that, in those cases to make sure that we upscale digital Africa, right? What is Microsoft doing in, in, this, in this vein? And what would you advise that youths in Africa should do to leverage on such opportunities? Thank you for that question. Um, I I don't think I would like to talk for Microsoft, but I would okay. like to give my views on it. Uh, right. I know that there are a number of programs that have been um, put out, especially after COVID, or in fact during COVID, and we we have some online platforms that are providing some learning opportunities for people who want to kind of uh, specialize in technology. So we have Google um, courses, we have Microsoft courses, and these are the things that they're making available to the public. But um, one thing I'd like to say is that the infrastructure, that might be a, a problem as in terms of internet, in terms of um, access to even technology, that's hardware, PCs. So these things are made available, but the only issue is that are they accessible by the youth? So in terms of the youth in Africa or in Ghana, I would like to say that, to be honest, as one of the panelists mentioned, you will have to take matters into your own hands. You would have to search for these opportunities because they are available. You would need to be like, find yourself in the right zones, in the right communities, in the right circles. I keep telling people that join communities because that is how you get to know what is going on in the industry. So if you do that, you are able to see some of the opportunities and leverage on them. So even as the organization are also coming out, we also need to do our part. These big tech companies are giving us the opportunities to upskill, to take our skills to the next level. As Foster mentioned, we have to look at where the country is going in order to kind of fix or to kind of train ourselves in that direction. You also need to also be proactive and like think ahead, look ahead. I keep using myself as an example. When I was in school, I did not know much about GIS, which is my background. And I did a bit of research and saw that it was really big in the Western world, but not as big in Africa. But I then decided to take it upon myself to do my own research more, to see how best I could use it to the benefit of my country or even a little part of my life in Ghana. And it kind of paid off and I was very happy for that. So you have to be able to think ahead, do your research, see how the trends are moving, see how the trends are going to be in the next few years, and definitely look around for the information. To be honest, that's one thing someone told me when I went to the university, that no information 
is not accessible. In fact, you can find it if you look for it because it is available. So I would say that, yeah, these opportunities are available and we need to be proactive to take advantage of them. Great. Thank you so much, um, Sienna. Mm -hmm. uh, they all, they all fall in line because I heard um, Benga talk about the great and determination to, to, to pursue greatness, mm -hmm. right? And so as, as much as Foster touched on the top to bottom, I think it all also has to deal with the bottom top, right? Foster, would you agree with me, right? So um, you run an organization, Hakla Foundation, which just concluded a hackathon, right? And this was so um, focused on growing the local um, the, the local people, like people within the universities or whatever, right, just to upskill themselves and try to solve problems as it affects the entire nation or the country or the nation, um, the, the continent in general, Africa in this context, right? So what, what would you say uh, what, to youth, right, um, leveraging on opportunities as they exist? Because Sienna touched on a lot of them, that a couple of opportunities exist, right? And then in, uh, institutions like a telecom industries or telecom organizations providing access because right now we're talking about digitalization and all the things have moved to digital, right? We have access to education um, uh, platforms all the way from US and all of this. But how can we then leverage what are industries doing to tie this in and what our private organization, what can private organization also do to make sure that they build that cohesiveness or cohesion together? Mm. So uh, yeah, you've touched on very key points. So we are talking about partnerships in this regard. Uh, but let me start from the individual stakeholders themselves, right? Today, uh, if we if we look back to the past and we look at where we sit today, I think we are very privileged. Uh, there wasn't a sophisticated platform like a Google where you could search for anything and find anything you are looking for. Uh, there weren't websites, there weren't social media platforms where you could interact and find people and connect with people across the globe. But today we have the opportunity to collaborate with people across uh, the continent. We have the opportunity to just use a keyword and find something we are looking for. And so for those who have access, the question is, are they even making good use of it, right? Are they, are they leveraging the tools they have? We are talking about a gap, but we are, there's a mess gap of people who have access and are not leveraging it. And this is about direction, is about niche gap, is about exposure, is about technical expertise. So the minority minority who do not have access to, to this infrastructure. We also need to focus on those who have the access and do not even know how to use it to the optimum, to put them to put them to the scale level where they be relevant. Imagine the number of mobile phone penetration in Ghana is quite significant and one of the highest on the African continent, as well as internet penetration, right? Uh, there's been a, we continuously preach the gospel of a gap, but the question is how wide is that gap? There are lots of interventions and investments made year on year daily. Uh, fiber optics cables are being expanded and laid across the continent, to increase internet coverage. Uh, we boast of 4G internet and 5G. There's basically minimum 2G coverage across the, the country in Ghana, right? In, in the remotest part of the country, you can, you can still use, you, you can still make a phone call even if you can't access data. So we are first in 99, 2021, and we are still having the same conversation and the same arguments. We need to go back and look at what progress has been made. We need to establish consistent research year on year to validate that the investments made shifted a little and not uh, forward. You are making the other gaps on and how wide those gaps are and how we can close them down. That is it with regards to uh, uh, access. Um, first, it looks like you're breaking up. I don't know it's for uh, it's from uh, our end. Sienna, is first breaking up by your end? Uh, individuals who need to upskill them. Yeah, here. Yes. How do industry or access? It stems from both sides. Um, 
governments in providing an enabling environment through policy, through regulatory frameworks, and all of that to support these telecommunication industries uh, or organizations. But don't forget, they pay licenses to access the spectrum through which they broadcast these networks, right? They pay taxes. Mm -hmm. they, they have employees to hire. Some of these telcos now have actually emptying mobile money through these uh, entire uh, uh, ratio of people, right? There are over 300,000 merchants across the country. Very, very significant, right? And so when there's a cost to doing business, they make profit. But for them to, to, to be able to keep their shareholders happy, as well as provide access to all in, in terms of equality and, and all of that, we need to also accommodate, we need to, we need to find means and ways to create incentives for them to say, okay, if, you have, if the cost of data is five Ghana cities per, per gigabyte, right? Okay, and there's going to be a direct correlation where you say, okay, if you cut down the cost of data to X amount, then there's going to be a slash in corporate tax or the certain taxes that are hit by that are hit on them by by doing the telco and uh, ask them to provide a reach that people need to be able to access these 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 uh, resources okay thank you foster um move over to um Benga for some reactions on this uh looking at look at this from the nigerian ecosystem what can we learn right Benga, thank you you're welcome yeah sure up to there okay so can you be more specific um you wanted my reactions i wonder if your, your reaction with regards to what foster was talking about i mean speaking about great determination and looking at how um the industries can play play a role right in upskilling digital africa Okay, so definitely I think that um, the industry can play a, a huge role. Uh, first of all, um, I think we have to give kudos to the big um, tech companies, companies like Microsoft, <laughs> um, for the immense work that they're doing, organizing a lot of trainings, giving out tools to um, young people. Um, Google also, you know, is doing very fantastically well uh, in terms of Google digital skills, a lot of free training and all of that. So, and then the same thing can be said for Facebook. In fact, Facebook has taken it a notch further and you know, they've, been, they've been having this digital skills program for, for women, you know, called Boost Your Business um, for a while, and she means business. And so the big tech companies are really trying. I think that we cannot just leave this to for the big tech companies alone. I think that essentially every single um, firm in Africa that wants to attract top tech talent needs to invest in top tech talent. The people you want to hire will not fall from ever. So essentially, if we keep complaining as, as employers of labor that you know, the quality of people that are applying for jobs, you know, that you know, iron is tough, um, graduates are not skilled enough, we can do something about it, right? We can. Right. In, in a personal capacity, for instance, I know that you know I, I, I do see this, you know, you know, speaking a lot of program seminars to skill up people. But as an organization, for instance, we give interns a, a chance, right, um, to 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 learn, to grow, uh, because essentially, like, if you think about even every single person on this panel, right, somebody give us a chance, right. So I think that that's the approach. We should not just leave um, upskilling young people to just big tech firms. Every single firm that has about three persons, four persons, five persons in the payroll, that you have people, you have a team, and you want to attract top talent, you need to start thinking proactively about how to groom that, you know, how to groom them, right? It could be something as simple as internship, something as simple as training, right? Giving up scholarship in any way that you can. And I also think that we should um, go just beyond looking at just tertiary education because. It's, it's really easy to get carried away and to just focus on, you know, the graduates, the people that are about to graduate. What about folks in secondary school? I think that one other area that we should also look at is career, career choice. A lot of times people just get, they have no clue what they want to do with their lives until they get to university. And by then, they've already like studied one course and then they have to like take change of course. Or in Nigeria, 
this is the slang. I applied for a course. They gave me, right? People just study whatever, right? They're not thinking, there's no strategy, there's no plan. They're not thinking, this, see, this is the gospel truth. There are some courses that when you go to school in Africa, you already know that there's no job anyway. You just know. Even from the name of the course, I'm not going to mention any course on this call. From the name of the course, you already know there's no job waiting for you anyway, right? So I think essentially we need to be more strategic. Right? We need to take this gospel even down to our high schools or secondary schools and help young people make better career decisions. Like We need to be more um, strategic about this. right? And it's been said earlier, so that we can have young people who go to our institution, you know, study courses that the market demands you know, and graduate with skills that the market demands. I, I think that jobs, um, because <laughs> we, are the world, we are the most youthful continent, um, but the second most populous continent, job creation is definitely a priority for Africa. So, my advice and my plea to all the entrepreneurs that are watching this right now is, you know, make sure you do something to improve the level of, 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 of the, the experience, the digital skills level of young people, at least in your community. Do something, right? And I also want to say, to, you know, to all the young people who listen to this, you know, remote jobs are great. So the fact that maybe you're struggling to get jobs where you are, remote jobs are great. There's so many freelancing sites, right? You're not constrained to your country, to your location, you can get jobs, right? But this is it. It's a two-way street. We need skills. We need both skilled youths who are good enough to attract jobs. And we also need young entrepreneurs who can create jobs. This is my submission. Right. Thank you, Binga. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's why you have so many awards up there, right? <laughs> <laughs> and also, you want to say Richard. something? Richard, if you permit yes, me, yeah, I, yeah. you brought my attention to something, right? So there's one thing that's go, most important and utilized, right? They, every single university has a career office. A career counseling office and a counseling unit to support students. Are you gonna go but, here? Coming in? <laughs> Are you gonna go there? Hello, Richard. Can you hear me first? I said, Are you gonna go there? Career counseling? <laughs> oh, no, 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 really I, work. I, no, no, no. I just, I just want you to understand something, right? Okay. For most of the students, I talked about knowledge gap in my earlier submission about That's the right, existence indeed. of infrastructure and access and people not utilizing yeah. it, right? Mm -hmm. um, these, these, these institutions or these uh, uh, offices are created not just to sit there to see and to take a box to see the, the career office exists in the school. The reason why the likes of an Ashesi University, an academic city university, far, 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 has a higher employment, uh, uh, graduate employability, is because these offices are vibrant. It's a two-way affair, right? It's for you to counsel somebody, is a push and pull effect. The student has to be willing to pull, and the student has to be willing to push to get the opportunity, and the counseling unit has to be willing to pull the student into the office to give them the right guidance, right? So we need to go back and look at the processes and how we prepare students before they graduate. In your final year, you go to, uh, you are assigned to your lecture, you go submit a topic, you write pieces or submit the paper or whatever it is, you defend it, and that is, that is your preparation to the industry, which is very wrong, right? So we need to really, really look at, really look at what happens in the final year of the student and at what phase in the four, four year uh, 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 undergraduate program, for example, should you start to prepare? Oh, so bad. We are losing you, Foster. A student for the job market. When we are able to close some of these gaps, these had. Hello, it's so bad we're losing your foster. Too, too bad. But those are great contributions there. It's amazing one, right? Um, I'm sure that CN, CNN will it. agree with this. Um, at some point, we lost you there, foster. Uh, I think your internet was a little bit um, challenging. Um, oh, could you could sorry. you recount like some of the, the, the last 10 seconds, 45 seconds of what you said? I think it will help. Uh, um, yeah. So I was saying 
that's it's going back down. Too sad. Too sad. Um, Sienna, sorry, um, not to cut you short, Foster, but your internet is not really great right now, and uh, we're really struggling to hear you. We can't hear anything you're saying currently. Um, Sienna, what do you have to say? Ca career counseling, I mean, um, having go steady GIS because you read about it. Because now, in this case, this was you career counseling yourself, right? <laughs> Reading and utilizing digital tools, like Foster mentioned, that we are in a good age where we have um, um, Google, right? What would you what, what can you say to this? The career counseling offices yeah. in Africa do they work? Right? Do we have to also reform the staffs who work there to get this to be honest. <laughs> and right? <laughs> to be honest, I'm the I'm the I'm the worst person to ask this question because I never stepped foot in that office. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I never did. In fact, I did not even know about it until my third year. Wow. I'm so I'm sure that I didn't know about the career counseling office until my third year. I think I was supposed to go there for an, uh, a, a receipt or something, but I'm not proud of that. Teaching and I really school, hope that. You mean uh, academic? Is, is Foster still talking? I can't tell. I'm just going to have to mute him okay. uh, because his network is not really good here. Okay. Uh, let's go on. Yeah. So, um, with the career counseling offices, I think it's about time they revamp. And in revamping, they should revamp with like organizations. So kind of like Hack Lab Foundation and um, any other uh, skill training organization. Because to be honest, students don't really know much about career counseling and you would have to get them when they start thinking about it. And to be honest, these things are personal decisions. I, for instance, I was really hard on myself. So I used to take matters into my own hands and doing my own research, trying to like think about what I wanted to do, which was really difficult because you have so many interests. Some of the things don't really look interesting to you. The course you're doing, you're not really into it. So it's like finding the right people or the right person to talk to is an issue. Some students are really like very closed up. They don't really open up. It's difficult to talk to them. So it's like, as Foster said, the students have to be willing to be counseled. The students have to be willing to actually come out and say, look, they need to understand and know, uh, kind of look for where they can fit in, in terms of their careers. And the organizations, as you said, the career counseling offices, to be honest, uh, in the public schools is difficult. They don't always work. They work for a specific um, group of students but not everybody. In fact, people don't really know about them. So you would have to make them aware in terms of like programs that we, pre uh, we prepare for the students. So as um, as you were, you were, we were talking about, you'd have to create some programs that will help the students know about these careers that are out there. I keep talking with my co-founder uh, of my community that we need to make students aware of the different um career choices that they have because as i was growing up i just knew about doctor nurse and i didn't know i didn't even know about architecture and the rest i just knew just the basics so it's about time we start from the grassroots as well but also try as much as possible to make the current youth that's those in the high schools and the universities to know that they really need to start thinking about their career try and give them a reason why they should think about it because for me, I wouldn't really listen to you unless you have something to show me. If you do not show me that, okay, um, for me, I got to see how the world was through my brother because he's older and he's five years older than me. So looking at his life, I got to see how tough it was when you're growing up. So that was something that pushed me to kind of think about my life and think about what I wanted to do. And it might not be the same for others, but we need something to make them see why they need to take their career seriously because some people are really not motivated and i keep saying that you can't push them until they are ready as foster said but we really need to make them see why it is important and i think the the interest is there but we just need to make sure that they have access and they can definitely come out and take advantage of it because it's, it's a difficult decision to make for some people but you need to definitely make them see it 
Okay, Benga, um, Nigeria, <laughs> career <laughs> counseling. <laughs> let's 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 just touch base on this while we wrap up the conversation because we are almost we are at the end of the entire conference, and I like that this is the session ending it because um, it's what we want to see. We want to see changes within education. We want to see changes with youth. We want to see grit and determination. We want to see people chasing time. I mean. Um, Mark, who's from um, Mark Allen, who joined the call yesterday all the way from Haiti, the Caribbeans, he mentioned that we don't need to wait. We need to start from home. We don't need to wait for the degrees. Start learning from home, right? Um, your last reaction, uh, Benga, and then we'll allow Foster to say some of the last words we missed because the internet was um, freaking out. Welcome back, Foster, though. Let's hear from you, Benga. Okay, so I think my final reaction would be that um, as young Africans, uh, we essentially need to take advantage of technology to help lift um, other young Africans and lift the entire continent out of poverty, right? There's, there's too much poverty in Africa. It's, it's just not sustainable. It's just not sustainable, you know? Um, before, we used to say that Africa is on the cake of gunpowder, but I think right now the, 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 the cake has burst, right? It's, we are no longer sitting on the cake. The cake has cut out, right? And that's why you have, you know, a lot of unrest across Africa, you know, a lot of anger, you know, pent up anger, because it doesn't make sense to spend, you know, four or five years in the university and come out and then there's no job, right? It just doesn't make sense. So my plea to young people out there is essentially get skilled, get a skill, get something, something legit to do, right? And then also for the entrepreneurs out there, think about how you can grow your business. See, the fact that you're running a small business does not mean your business has to stay small. If we have more successful small uh, small businesses that become big, then we can hire more people, right? We can, let me give an example, for instance. So if our group we started, we, you know, we it was just one employee right now. We have about 13 people on our payroll, right? As we grow, we definitely can hire more people as we grow. So we need small businesses to transition into bigger businesses, right? So as young Africans running businesses, doing things, we need to start thinking scale, scale. It's okay to start small, but it's not okay to stay small. Start thinking about how to scale your business, how to grow your business. You know, start thinking about, you know, are you going to deploy a platform strategy? Are you going to deploy, you know, a marketplace strategy? Are you going to build, a, you know, a software as a service? And just find a twist and angle, you know, to make your business grow. Because as your business is growing, uh, of course, you know, revenues are increasing, your impact is increasing, and more importantly, you're also serving a social mission because you're literally um, accelerating prosperity across the continent by reducing unemployment, by creating more change. So. These are my final words. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Benga, for Thank the you. privilege to host you respectfully. You. Um, Foster, let's hear those final words you were saying. Education. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so enthused. Yeah, so uh, just, just to summarize everything I was saying, uh, I'm just trying to say that uh, we have the solutions at, at our phones, right? We, we don't need to think too far in terms of innovating and coming up with something totally new. Uh, there was a reason why the structures our institutions have were, were developed. And going back to understand that reason or the science behind why gives us an understanding of how it it's impacts the life of the student. What we haven't done much, and if you compare a school that has high graduate employability rate to a school that has a low graduate employability rate, you realize that the difference is the institutions work, right? And I also talked about the push and pull effect. Who is the beneficiary and who is the, the, the uh, uh, benefactor, if, if, if I put it that way? So we need to be able to figure out a system that allows for both of them to understand how their, their role contributes to their own success, right? If I'm a benefactor and I have a beneficiary, the beneficiary should be willing to receive whatever it is I'm giving them. And, uh, and so we need to be deliberate, create programs, create initiatives that make these offices, like I talked about the career office, as vibrant as possible. Ashesi University is what it is and has a high graduate employability rate because their career office is very effective, right? If you go, we understand that the population of most of the public institutions and the ratio of officers in the career office to the number of students is, is, is posturous, right? And so we can't compare 
in terms of access quality to this, uh, the, the same way. But we can figure That's out. Right. A way. We can figure out a way. For example, in KNUSD, as the school started to grow bigger, they started to decentralize power into a collegiate system, right? Where mm -hmm. they decentralize power and allow the colleges to run in a semi-autonomous structure. That means mm -hmm. not every, not all decisions have to be taken at the top. So if there's a, the school had a, a shared service system, for example, a career office, they could bring this, decentralize these shared services into the various colleges and allow them to run micro programs that are directly related to the courses or the programs being run in those colleges. So the career office of an engineering college or a college of engineering would be different from, uh, would run different programs and will build different relationships in terms of industry partnerships, ecosystem partnerships to increase the value they give the students when they come to the career office, right? So let's not ignore the fact that these institutions or offices have been created and exist and people are being paid salaries to sit there. We need to find means and ways to bring them back to life and help make them vibrant. We created the Hackler Foundation out of KNUSD when we were still students and we had identified a gap and we wanted to solve that problem. And so we took the initiative and the honors on us to do it. And five years on, over 10,000 people are benefiting from this, right? We work closely with academic institutions. We still create extracurricular programs on the various campuses because it is one thing to want to fight a, a legacy. It's another thing to want to acknowledge the existence of the legacy and its role and how you can contribute to adding on to that legacy for, it, for, for longevity's sake. So let's not ignore, uh, as the saying goes in Chi, Sankofi in Chi, going back to the past to pick from the past and refresh it to a new setting with context around it. It's not forbidden. So we can always do that and we'll save a lot of resources doing that. Thank you very much. Um, can you guys hear me? Uh, I think uh, my audio was messy. Right, thank you very much, Foster. Good to have you, and that's all time will allow. Um, we're very much privileged to have ended with this. There are a lot of insights from this particular panel, and then we want to see that youths would actually take up the ons to make a difference, enabling or building the next generation of digital innovations in Africa. Thank you, Fosa, for your work with educa uh, education. I, I saw you, but you mentioned as I said a lot. I was about to ask you why 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 aren't you mentioning some of the public institutions? But uh, you, you gave you gave a good reason why you are not mentioning them. So we appreciate no, you. No, I'm, an, I'm an alumnus of KNUST, right? I, I, I so I, I, I saw I saw, out, I saw what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> and we turn out very good graduates as well. I don't deny that. But here yeah, we can't deny the fact that Ashesi has money to leave a mark on the right uh, on the country in terms of education so I they mean, said the case let's follow through mm -hmm. uh, you, you you are you are a great example of a, a good graduate from KNUST, right it's good to 100%. see a fellow alumnus yeah it's 100 <laughs> beautiful thank you benga thank you sienna that all you. time will allow i really appreciate it's a privilege to have hosted you uh thank you so much